Welcome to The Web Show. It's a very 90s-tastic episode today. Uh, if you love the show California Dreams, you will remember Brentley Gore. He has a new album out called At The Ready. I will put all the details for the streaming and his website in the pinned comment below. It's a brilliant album. I love chatting to him. Thank you, Brentley, for taking the time. So, ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy Brentley Gore. Honestly, thank you so much for for doing this. I nearly I was I was in New York when you were doing I will talk about this, but I was in New York when you were doing your reunion. Well, I was in New Jersey and I was desperate to come across, but I was at a film festival, so I wasn't able to quite make it. So I um I'm hoping to to that you're going to come to the UK at some point. I'm planning on it. You are? I mean, I mean the huge I'm huge. It's a huge plan and a and a and a goal of sorts. I mean, I've I've been there, traveled, of course, but um, not with the show. And certainly, at the worst case scenario, it would just be me with my music. Best case scenario, I would bring all the dreams guys with me. You recorded your. You released your latest album. I think it's your fifth solo album. Is it at the ready? Could you talk about it? What were your inspirations? Apart from other projects that I have done, like California Dreams, it's it's my second full length solo record. I have EPs and things like that that I'd released, and I certainly did California Dreams first, and then I was in a band with John Hawks and Rodney Eastman called King Straggler, and we did a couple of tours and made a couple of records. At the Ready has been an incredible journey that's taken place from the end of California dreams to now the common thread for all of the record, the entire record, they're all co-written songs and they were all done at a very high level of recording. Um, they were all based around production deals and record deals that I had. And so if you do four songs or five songs, then, you know, you, you have those and then those, preferably turn into a record deal, but those ne that never materialized. So for many years, they just sat on a hard drive. And, and um, I've been, as I do these interviews, I've been telling people the truth, which is like, I think I was just waiting for permission to release those, not only for my own, uh, you know, gumption to, to, to make that happen, but also because there was a lot of business involved. Um, so it took a lot of work to get that all cleared and and get the masters and, and release them. And it was just time to do it. So um, it's been a very long process and I'm really proud of the work and, and uh, of the process that I went through. It's very cathartic. Originally, I was struck by like a kind of 90s nostalgic energy vibe to it, which I really connected with. It was like so beautiful and melodic. And then there were a few tracks where like it was a bit of 70s kind of early Stones, Beatles influence sounded. And so it was really nice that I saw you talk about it where you were saying that it was the earlier songs and it, it made total sense. And um, how did you choose from all these songs that you had, which ones would end up on the album? Do you consider the album as a whole with the tone and the message that you want to come across? I literally chose the songs based on the fact that they were co-writes. I didn't put any solo songs on there. Those were all, they're in that pop 90s genre, pop rock vibe. You know, they're, it's, it doesn't feel modern, but to me, they feel timeless a bit. You know, they're songs and they're melodic. And at, at the end of the day, I'm a Beatle boy. You know, I mean, I love a melody and a good crafted song, period. Are there any, obviously you love them all, or are there any stand that, that stand out for you for a particular reason? Maybe it's a bit more close to your heart than others, or it really is just you love every single one as much? A lot of times there are standout songs, but these songs have been with me for so long that I really don't have, uh, you know, if I say, if, if I had to choose one, I would have to say the last song on the record, which is All I Ever Wanted. All I ever wanted was free. From everything you wanted me to be. Whoa, whoa. 
And I think it was probably the most throwaway, less cerebral, heartfelt kind of just let's just write this song. And um, it has a lot of my guts in it. And it, it, it's expo it, it exposes me a lot. And everything else is a little more, I, I come from an, the artist point of view, you know, I, I always write like a diary. I don't say, oh, here's a song. This would be a great song. Let's write it. I'm just, I don't do it like that. I kind of just do it like it's my journal. I could go back to every single song that was written and put the relationship I was in, where I was living, what was going on. It all ties in with my life. And that's just how I like to express my the music. What is your creative process when you have that initial kernel for a song idea? How do you get it from that idea to the recording studio? Initially, um, it's been, for the most part, picking up my guitar. Generally, it's always I started on acoustic guitar, and. Um, picking up the guitar and having a melody and then having an inspired um, emotion that's that comes out of me from the the chords that I'm playing and then the melodies I'm I'm a melody person so melodies come quickly for me so if I get the melody then I usually write from the top down it's rare that I'd be like, oh, this would make a great chorus. Now let's go back and find the verse and fit that in. Like I kind of go A to Z. And that's just how I like to write. Um, so generally it's inspiration and it certainly wells up with what's going on in my life experience. So if it's like, oh, I got to write, I got to write. I know it's coming. And then sometimes I'll write three songs to get the one that I want. Strike me as someone that when the idea comes and that happens, um, it just flows and it happens pretty quickly. Is that correct? Or can you linger on a song for months and months and it's never quite finished? Generally the best ones and the ones that last ha ha happen quickly. I mean, Sting always talks about, he's like, well, I'll get a chorus and then, you know, six months later I'll find the verse and then six months later. You know, I think that's possible and I've done that for sure in my life, but I, I, I feel like that it happens, like it just, it comes through you and it, it just spits out. What was the reason you wanted to have this album as a co-writing album? It, I have a lot of unfinished and you're a filmmaker, right? So you understand. You have a lot of these ideas and, and mine, Tends to, tend to translate into songs that ha sit on a hard drive and you don't do anything. And, um, you know, I, I was just talking about this yesterday. I think it's really easy to get lost in making everything perfect and needing everything to be exactly so, so that you feel really confident about or what you're sharing. And these, this batch of songs have been sitting on my hard drive for so long that I, I found one song, which was um, the second song on the record. Um, and it, said, it, it basically just did it for me. It was like, now I have 12 songs that need to be released. It's just time, just do it. Don't be so critical. Stop being so self-critical. Let people who like the music, like the music, you know, I I, I always want to stay ahead and, and do something new and something original. And, you know, I, I wait for that opportunity. And, you know, you can wait until you're in the grave. You know, it's like, what's the point of that? So it was just time. And I gave myself permission to fail. You know, it's like you just have to give yourself permission to let it be what it is and not um, let them be your children. You love them regardless of how well they do in school. 
that seems a very good piece of advice for anyone who would like to pursue music, whether or not it's just for themselves or to release. Um, does it feel like an industry at the moment where being your own in control of your own music is more accessible in terms of being able to do your own releases and 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 choosing who you work with more is it more flexible being an independent music artist well these days it's necessary it's the only outlet really even if you had a large record deal the record deals and i could talk to you a little bit about this that's a big conversation but the you know, let's just say any art form, I would use that piece of advice because it self -criti criticism, especially for an artist, you know, is mandatory, but it's also mandatory to not be too self-critical. So it's important to do that. And these days, everything is on your own because of our availability of the internet, which is like from California dreams to the internet, everything changed as you know. And um, it wasn't, it, you know, in some ways it did me more harm than good because it, then I could wear all the hats and I could sort of keep my control of having everything the way that I wanted. It, but at the same time, you know, I mean, I'll just use the Beatles, you know, who do you, do you love a McCartney song or do you love a Lennon McCartney song? It's, it's like, you still love a McCartney song always, but it's not Lennon McCartney. There's just a synergy that happens in art when you're creative with other people involved that, that happens. It's just like, uh, you know, babies. You know, it's it's male female energy. It's just you just have to create that. And uh, so, one more thing I'll say about that is that um, even the record companies are requiring the people to have X amount of followers and and plays before they'll offer them a fifty fifty record deal. And I know someone who ha makes. He gets a million plays a month, million plays a month, makes a substantial income, got offered all the record deals that he wanted for a 50-50 deal, which means he would have to have two million plays to break even. He's like, why do I want to do that? What's the point of that? So it's, you know, it, it's it's mandatory. The the record companies and the and the powers and the and the big machine want you to be involved in your own self promotion. It's just mandatory. So yeah, yeah it's easier to do it, um, but it's also a full time job. It's very much like the, in the film industry. To be honest, it's like always the the decision of trying to go through sales agents and distribution, or do you try and do it yourself, but then you're wearing so many hats and it's exhausting. Um, you know, I think when independent artists do these things that they love, there's obviously that really huge drive with you just have to do it. And it's this creativity that you need to get out there and express. But at the same time, it can be really challenging. And how do you battle, if you do battle, keeping that creativity, but maybe having days where you don't have the motivation or you feel exhausted or you've got so many hats where you're trying to do so much. How do you make that work yourself as a, a human? <laughs> I think it's important to have an incredible balance of life. And I, I, I think there's times where you put in overtime and that's necessary. And I think there's times where you don't work because when I left Nashville, which is where I was born, and went to move to Manhattan, I went to performing arts school in New York, American Musical and Dramatic Academy. And I got there and I had come straight from the womb <laughs> in Nashville. And they said, a lot of people had gone to college, to university and then graduated and then gone conservatory after that I just went straight to conservatory and the thing that was lacking for me was experience 
I was 18, you know, and it didn't have a lot of life experience. And so um, I think it's really important to cultivate a rich life and have rich hobbies. Um, I've certainly seen musicians who are amazing musicians and you really enjoy their, you know, our set of music or their song that they've put up. But a biography is way more encouraging to me as a human than the person's ability to play his music. I want to know about the person. And I think that that it, it when I'm um, when I'm getting uh, what what's the word? Uh, you know, when I'm addicted to what I'm doing and I'm not happy and healthy, it starts to creep through. It gets a little ugly and it's okay to do some of that, but you have to know when to pull that back. And that's, that, that's what I would say my experience. That's what I would tell my younger self. I was like, don't forget to play. What was your journey from the conservatory in New York to then California dreams? Did you set out to act and do music or just music or act or just how did that happen? That's kind of where it all started for me to break it up because I had done a lot of musical theater in high school and I played in bad bands. But when I got to, when I did musical theater, I found I was pretty naturally I was naturally good at that. And so when I went to conservatory, I I didn't like the presentational aspect of musical theater at that point. I liked sort of the looking in on it, looking in on the art piece instead of like, here I am. Even though I love a big production, I'm all about the Bowie production, you know, or, you know, the Queen production. I love that. Um, but I felt more comfortable separating the two. And um, when I left New York and went out to LA, I started auditioning, you know, for film and TV, which I loved. And I was obsessed with movies when I was a kid. I used to watch sit in three movies. I would go on the weekends by myself and I would watch three movies in a row. Like, I love it. You, you may be the same way. I don't, I'm sure you are. And, um, and I was obsessed with movies. Um, and so I liked the acting aspect for that art piece, but I didn't like the presentational aspect of musical theater. And then when I did California dreams, it seemed like a natural fit. Ultimately music, no one was telling me what I needed to write and sing. And that was a lot more freeing for me as an artist than it is to say, can you interpret these lines of the script that I have? It's just a different art form. California Dreams um, at the time really stood out because it was like the musical element of the show. You know, you had Saved by the Bell, but the California Dreams was really great to have the band aspect and the soundtrack and all the songs. but with your with all the characters so musical and you yourself being so musical did they lean on you for to incorporate any of your ideas into the music or it really was say this sing this no only interpretation so act acting you know it's a big business there i mean we had a deal with uh, mca records and then um a, and then the deal was with nbc so you know they, I mean, literally week one, I was reminded, you know, you're, you are a prop. I mean, I was just like, are you telling, are you saying that out loud? <laughs> you are replaceable. And I was just like, mm. and then, you know, that really got me going. I was like, you mother, <laughs> I mean, I was mad. And, um, but you know, you have an NBC show. And you're, you know, you're on set, you know, next to Will Smith and Fresh Prince and then Jay Leno's the other door. What do I know? I'm just a kid. You know, California Dreams taught me a lot. I thrived in the, you know, here. <laughs> I thrived here, you know, um, because I'm so audio. I think I'm more audio than I am visual. 
And and so when they put me on the, the in the studio on um, under headphones, I was like, I want to be here forever. Um, but I hadn't written great songs or, or anything. I, I, I wasn't near the caliber of, of where I needed to be to be able to do that music. Um, so I pretty much just did what I was told. It felt like you had, you all had this incredible level of fame, so young and so it felt overnight. Was that the case? And how was that? How did you deal with that? <laughs> so I guess it's just best to be transparent, right? I was running around with Leonardo DiCaprio and Tobey Maguire and roommates with Kevin Conley and, you know, Jason, Jeremy London and Reese Witherspoon. So for me, it was, I'm doing a Saturday morning show. And that's just because who do you compare yourself to? And comparison is the thief of joy, right? So it's like, I loved it. I loved being in the, in the spotlight. Any one of us could have been in the Titanic. You know, it could have happened to any one of us. You know, I was there, you know, right across the street in the Viper Room when River Phoenix passed away. And so it's like a lot of that being inundated with Hollywood I was right th there. So it didn't seem like, oh, I'm so famous because there was so many more famous people. Um, but when I went out of Hollywood and we'd even go to Disneyland or something, it was like, wow, everyone's like wants autographs. Now people ask me if, you know, if I give an autograph, they're like, isn't that so cool? Someone's asking you for your autograph. And I'm like, that doesn't seem weird to me it just seems kind of normal at the time it was new you know yeah I mean it was it was cool but but there again my, I was comparing myself to a much larger loftier goal and is that after you left California Dreams did you you continue to pursue acting as well as music didn't you I did I did a little bit of acting um but what happened was, is I kept waiting around. I didn't like waiting for a job. So music was so tangible. You could pick up your guitar, write a song, and it's like, there it is. It's like you could pick it. It's like you probably, you pick up a camera and you do it something and then you, there it is. You can edit it. You can do whatever you want with it. And so I, I really feel like that, um, there's two things that happen with my acting. One is I got incredibly picky, which I shouldn't have should say yes until you can't, until you have to say no. That's advice I would give people in Hollywood. And then the other thing is, is that I turn things down like big things that I shouldn't have. And um, so I really kind of, shut the door on things that I shouldn't have no, that, that maybe I would have been better to have done those things and trusted the process of how it all worked out instead of being so adamant about this is what I want it to look like and feel like it's that it's the, it's holding the bird you know it's like if you're if you don't want them to fly away you got to hold it oh so tight but you can't hold it too tight or you kill it so I think I experienced both sides of that I think I learned a lot um, don't bite the hand that feeds you and I think also um, and I do have I have had in my in the past some regret there you know but really at this point I've I've uh, their life lessons. Do you remember having a moment where you had made that decision and you didn't want to be waiting and you, the first time you went, actually, this is how I want to do things. This feels right. This feels what I need to be doing, whether it was when you decided to do a, an album or an EP. Do you remember a moment? Yeah, I do. And I, and I remember being, I, so we were going around, I was going around to coffee shops and playing songs with my guitar. And so was John Hawks and Rodney Eastman, who's also another great actor. And they were playing and singing as well. 
And we decided to be in a band because we we said, let's just put these three together and whoever writes the songs and sings the song, uh, whoever writes the song sings the lead and then we will do backups. Well, it ended up being a really incredible experience where we had um, play, we sold out a lot of Hollywood shows. We did two American tours. We made a couple records. Um, we got a lot of film and TV placements and things like that. And that band, King Straggler, really showed me that I, I felt I was utterly, completely happy doing that job. We were touring, we were writing, we were playing great shows, um, wasn't making a ton of money, what, you know, did, wasn't like global stage or anything, but it was just, I just felt uh, a little resolve there, you know, a, little, a, a lot of fulfillment. And um, that, had, that had happened after a couple of music solo deals so um that some of these songs on at the ready are are on um so yeah I, w I would say that was a pretty defining moment for me because when we when we get in the van and you go across the country with your brothers and you know and you're playing all these shows every, every other night you, you've got to love it because if you don't you, you know it's it that's not an easy life Going back to your love of news, uh, movies very quickly, um, I was the same, seeing multiple, the marathons when I was a kid. I just loved spending, taking my pillows and my blankets, going to the cinema and spending six hours there. If you had to pick, I know this is probably, again, like pick your favourite song question. If you were to pick three movies from your childhood that now you can look at a frame, hear a song from, look at the poster, and it totally takes you back and encapsulates encapsulates what your childhood inspirations or loves were, what three movies would you pick? Oh my gosh. I mean, I have to, I have to say the wizard of Oz because that was a defining movie for me. And as a child, I had watched an interview um, of yours and never ending story. <laughs> was a really huge childhood movie for me as well. And I have to lump those together because that, that was for me as well. Um, and then as, you, as I got older, all those John Hughes films, 16 Candles, Breakfast Club, I would have to say Breakfast Club was up there pretty high for me. I loved that. I was fascinated by the characters and the stereotypes of that. Of like, so I have to say that, and then I watch it every year still. As I, it's a wonderful life. I love that. I'm I'm a sucker for that. In terms of at the ready, what are your plans? Are you you're going out on tour? Or you can where can people find out about where they might be able to see you and where they can get the album? Is it streaming? Is it physical? So I want to do both. I want to start sort of streaming a little bit. Um, and playing locally a little bit here um, before I get a whole band together. Um, it's really, that's the other thing about music and talking about getting people together. It gets expensive, especially in Nashville. It's like, someone's like, yeah, I'll play a show with you. It's, you know, 700 bucks. It's like, are you high? I'm not, <laughs> it's like, no, that's why it's good to be in a band. Cause then you're just all for one and one for all and you just do it. But to my credit, I'll say I can sing and play the songs on my own and sort of work in that way and then sort of bring people in as we as we go. Um, I want to do some streaming and I want to do some live shows um, locally and within the southeast, you know, first. And then ultimately what I'd really like to do, Lisa, is like 
tie in the California Dream shows with uh, some of my stuff. I feel like that's it's a good match. This record is not too far off from the music that California Dreams fans like. So <clears throat> we literally have three and a half hours of California Dreams music that we could play live. And then if I sort of work those in together, I feel like that that would be acceptable. I feel like our California Dreams fans would accept that. So uh, I'm really kind of trying to work that a little bit because I, I, I feel like that, that would, that's going to be a good, that's what we're working on right now, putting together. And I just th have a website, BrentleyGore.com, and that's where all of my socials are on there. You can find out what's going on. You know, it's just BrentleyGore.com. It's easy to find all of that. You know? Well, it would be great to have you in the UK. Um the California Dreams reunion, I was really hoping to get to in New York, desperately. Um, how was that? Because I believe that was like 13, 14 years after the Jimmy Fallon reunion as well. Um, how was how is it when you all get back together? What was that night like? It was really uh, amazing, heartfelt, a lot of love in the room from fans and, you know, the cast members. We very much enjoyed it and loved it. We are all open to doing more of those because it was a good time. Now, when we come to the UK, we got to know, you know, as you know, it's if you're traveling, you, how many people are coming, where are we going to stay, what venue we're going to play, where we're going to do the meet and greet. It just all has to be set up. So if we do that, maybe you could just do a little film documentary on that. I would love to film when you come here. And also, if you need help with any kind of logistical stuff, let me know. I would love to to help in any way and have you over in the UK. Well, you'd be perfect. We'd love it. And I, you'd be perfect. And and I, you know, I just think that it's a, it's a good it's a good way to go. There's a there's a guy out from American Pie who tours around. He's touring around all over by himself, and he's doing the Comic Cons. Is that Thomas Ian? Exactly. He just does his Comic Cons and he plays his shows. I mean, it's very possible to do. It's just a matter of lining everything up. And I'm so creative. Like, I'm not that good at doing that logistic, you know, the logistics of that. But I'm working on it. And as I get the older I get, the better I'm, you know, I'm being forced. It's like I was saying, you're forced to kind of wear that hat. So, I think it's possible. I think it's just a matter of being really specific. But I do believe that, um, you know, the UK would be an amazing place because we have tons of people there that I think would love to come. Is there anything else that I haven't asked that you wanted to get across in terms of the album or anything happening coming up? Or do you feel like you've covered everything? Don't just don't be afraid to um, put it on your um, playlists put any songs that you like on your Spotify playlists because that really helps me. And, and as we all, as you're going to hear, I'm going to build my YouTube page a little bit better um, with doing a little more updated than my camera help, but you know, like, and subscribe always helps us as artists. <laughs>